to see more people in the um, conversations of diversity, trying different things, it will leave you, like if you have the intent, will lead you to where you are. Like you just have to have faith. I personally am more comfortable now with sharing a more vulnerable aspect of myself. There's more things that are out of our control than things that we can control. Let go of what you can control and just work diligently. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three of Artist Confidential with your host, Esther Yu. I am delighted to welcome conductor Lina Gonzalez Granados as our guest today. She is a highly acclaimed conductor, just to highlight a few of her great accomplishments. She was the winner of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra Sir George Solti Conducting Competition in 2019. She is currently a conducting fellow of the Philadelphia Orchestra and Seattle Symphony. And also she's the founder and artistic director of Unitas Ensemble. Lena recently made her New York Philharmonic debut and became the first ever Colombian conductor to lead the New York Phil, which is very exciting. Uh, it's an honor to have her on the show today. Welcome, Lena. Hello, Esther. Thank you very much for having me here with you and for giving me this platform that I feel it's so important. I feel very, very honored to be with you. I want to talk a little bit about your experience over the last year. Um, I imagine, you know, like all of us, you have kind of been grounded, which is unusual for us musicians. Um, how has being still and having time affected uh, your perspectives, your priorities, and your mental health? Esther, it's been an incredibly crazy year. I cannot tell you uh, how different and breaking through my life was. Um, so the first thing is that right where the pandemic started, I got COVID, which was very uh, scary and a uh, unknown experience because I just had it like, it was a uh, March 19 or 20. So that's on 2020, which is a uh, right, right before the pandemic started. So um, that for me was a huge, huge wake up call in a really different duration to where I'm now, because I, um, I think I didn't know anything or nobody knew what was going on in the United States or anything. And <laughs> it was the first time actually I was um, faced with mortality. Um, looking in hindsight, it wasn't that bad. It's just that I didn't know any better. This happened and then I finished my doctorate in May uh, after all this happened. I just felt like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed because I already had everything. It was so much. Uh, I was, I think, working more than when I wasn't in the pandemic, but in other things. And I just took a break, a huge break, and uh, start thinking of my mental health, my... Uh, my overall health in general to try to get better it meant a, a huge uh, like priority check uh, after like being so busy trying to see like where do I find myself happier like how does everybody else and everything fits in this new uh, uptake of life and definitely my family started taking more priorities and everything and this was beautiful because I think now uh, coming back to um, after a period of stillness, uh, coming back and uh, having more presence of my family and uh, my husband, my parents in my life has made it more rich. Has your perspective on the future of classical music changed um, during the pandemic? I'm yeah. when I say pandemic, I don't just mean the COVID nineteen. I also mean all the discussions that we've had over the past year about diversity, um, equity, inclusion, 
but also we've had discussions about the environmental impacts of, for example, touring. Given all this, how do you see the music and performing arts world changing post COVID? And what are some changes that you would like to see happen? For me, for example, the talks of diversity and inclusion uh, have always uh, been part of the forefront of my uh, life and identity is when I did UNITAS Ensemble. Uh, UNITAS was an ease, mean, mean, like it was created to answer a couple of those questions of diversity and inclusion at the beginning because I, I couldn't find a job I could like and I couldn't find a repertoire that I felt represented with that I could like put an identity with at that time we we're talking about five years ago and that produced a lot of results of uh, hiring people of color already doing these. So for example, in that, in that sense, I am very happy and always aware now um, to engage with people who are more aligned to the, my core beliefs, where is that a, where I feel, for example, that every, every person of every race should have a place on the table equally, not only like just a little piece of the pie that calls diversity and we all have to fit there and just fight like for, like with anger for this little piece of pie that cannot move because it's like, oh, first these ones or then these ones. And it's <laughs> like, no, it has to be bigger for all of us to, to do it. Having those conversations and also about a environmental crisis and climate, the climate emergency that we're living has to uh, be also on the forefront of all of us. So because um, we cannot expect only organizations to make change. So, for example, as a conductor, when you're starting that you have to hope, as you say, on a plane, like I have con made conscious uh, decisions of just blocking big places for one part and just like reducing my carbon footprint uh, as much as I can. I would love to see people engaging more locally. I think that it's very necessary if you want to solve or if you want to include or if you want to help on the carbon footprint. I would like to like, like very, very high profile artists just uh, engaging locally, even if the orchestra is or the institutions are not as big, they would, they would make a huge impact on their communities. Um, and I, I, that's what I would love to see happening more uh, and also to see more people in the um, conversations of diversity on the higher ranks, uh, to have a space on the table that um, is not only about diversity, you know, that, they, they, their, com that their contribution uh, is not only how they look, but what they have to say, because we have so much to to say, you know. I've had several conversations about this with fellow instrumentalists, but not yet with a conductor who has both an artistic role and also a directorship role. So I'm curious to you, what are the pros and the cons of digital performances? And some people say this will, this is, goes way beyond the pandemic and is kind of the future of performing arts and classical music and you know there's many different opinions on this but to, to you what what do you think i think at least for orchestras it was very long overdue um, and i think um it all comes back to outreach you know we're not talking about only outreach for us as music lovers of our age that are able to uh, purchase a ticket and go and sit down. But I am thinking, for example, for people in nursing homes that cannot be mobile. I used to do a lot of work back in Boston when I was young with community orchestras that go to nursing homes. And some of them would have to tune into the, like they could not even go to our little, uh, I don't know, concert space, but they would have to see it under rooms. So people that already have loved music, uh, classical music for a long time, and now they cannot. I mean, don't they deserve a chance? People who are outside the country or outside the, but they 
actually adore these orchestras and organizations and believe in the identity of their sound, they deserve to, to also maybe have a, a say, you know? So I think that it's about how, what, uh, like how do you approach outreach in, in, in general? I uh, listened to and read some of the interviews that you've done in the past. And often you mentioned that everyone has their own path. And there's no, you know, one route to success and everyone should make their own decisions and be authentic to themselves, which is something that I um, agree with tremendously. But I think in order to adhere to that great advice, there's also this sub level of um, knowing yourself very deeply. And as we're talking about the young people in the young generation today, um, I feel like increasingly, maybe the younger generation doesn't, is, is not quite um, sure what, know, what the term kind of knowing who you are really is. And I also work with young students um, teaching and master classes and things. And this is something I see for myself. And there's also studies showing, for example, if you ask young kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? They answer, nowadays they answer, I want to be rich, I want to be famous. But there's no clear uh, ambition or trajectory of how they want to achieve that. Whereas in past generations, you'd ask a kid, what do you want to be? And they'll answer, I want to be a fireman or I want to be a veterinarian. So, you know, very different answers. and. Um, were you someone who just always had a sense or knew what you wanted to do in life or was it more of a taking time and trial and error? I always knew, think, thought I knew I wanted uh, what I wanted in life, but uh, it never, I don't think it never came up the way that I think I was. So for when I was little, I just knew that I wanted to be a doctor. Doctor, being a doctor was my identity. Uh, I always got like into the principal's office to pre because I was prescribing kids at <laughs> age five. My parents were doctors, and <laughs> for a long time until I was, uh, I would say, old enough uh, to go to a, a hospital. Um, because I was like, oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. And then one day my dad was like, oh, you know, like you have always said that you wanted to be a doctor. So why don't we go to, to the hospital? And I went to the hospital and almost died, you know, like all of these. So um, just to say that from the beginning, it was very trial and error that uh, the trial always was, um, it had intent, always had intent. And then Musician was the, the next one. And then um, the, I'm a pianist. Becoming a pianist was never uh, clear for me. I always felt like a lot of anxiety when I entered college um, because I was like, okay, I, I personally feel this is not for me, but I only know this. So what, what do I do? And uh, I started going to different choirs and all of these and then I saw conduct conductors and I'm like this is what I want to do like I want to be in front so I just like shift so I think the adaptability is what had like was like key to my development I could not like I never saw a clear pattern even for example when I was being in these uh, really big shifting moments uh, I always did it with intent you know it doesn't like I was like okay I'm just gonna become a conductor I don't know what it is because in Colombia there are not women conductors I at that moment I never knew I mean I was 18 so or 19 when I decided to be a conductor and I, I was like I don't know what is this but I'm going to become this uh, because I had the intent so it didn't matter if I had role models at the moment or anything because I was just very convinced uh, that um, that's what I wanted. And then when I 
really found the beauty of conducting and that I saw that this was really my path, then I never stopped when the doors closed. So again, adaptability. So yes, trial and error, but it wasn't, you know, it's not even trial and error, but a lot of trials that have <laughs> gone, you know, like that have gone to this place. And then I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go to this place and then I'm gonna go to this. So I would say more trial. Hmm. trial and success than trial and error I think error wasn't the right word to use because I think even for myself you know when things when I've tried something and things haven't gone the way that I had hoped ultimately when I look back it was it always helped me to get to the next place so you know it's never really an error you're right about that yeah Um, but, but you know like so sorry that I interrupt you because I I talk a lot but uh, you know, like what you said, they, so for example, you said you had intent, like intent, uh, and then it takes you to where you want to be. I think, I wish I knew when I was young that like trying different things it will leave you, like if you have the intent, will lead you to where you are. Like you just have to have faith. That's like going to be like the magic on it that um and the element that you have no control uh, which is when will you arrive right you know but i always i always like follow that blindly and if i could i could tell like my 20 year old self or my 21 year old self you are gonna be there because you're making the work even it was a small or like a small uh increments in that trial that you didn't know because that was so parallel to what you wanted um, then oh my god I would have saved so much anxiety you know <laughs> like the, the the things that you can't control you know what you know uh, it, it, there's there's so many in this career there's more things that are out of our control than things that we can control so what do we do? Do we quit when there, we, we cannot hold control over things? Which is paradox or the complete mirror of what a career looks like because everything is like very, I don't know, controlled. So I don't know. I, I think as you say, uh, and as you ask me, I would say uh, let go of my control would be like, let go of what you can control and just work diligently uh, to what your intent is your purpose no that's great advice I definitely can relate to that uh about <laughs> you know many years of of a lot of anxiety of over things I ultimately could not control so yeah I definitely relate uh, my my continuous question from that was um you know for the younger generation what advice would you give to help them really discover themselves and and to find out who they are let go of any expectation uh, that uh, someone can have on you uh, so you can excel in your life it is very hard to say it because uh, for kids they don't understand that or for that young generation but when you are already I would say somehow um, in a career where you're finding your path identity-wise, sound-wise, any expectation or what you said about Instagram, you know, any any image of what people think you should look like. It's my, my advice. Like you need to, you really need to just, um, I don't know, become deaf and just listen to yourself. You know, the only sound that that you can have is the one that you can produce in the comfortability of your own heart and mind. So it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, unless if you're not if you, if you're not original, then like you can't. Uh, do anything with music how about you Esther I would love I would love to hear what you have to say I agree with you I mean I think if you just look historically um, the facts of the lifestyle that's the young generation lives now versus 
in the past, for example, let's let's say the artists that I look up to from past generations, or maybe you look up to as well. You know, it's a very, very different world <laughs> we live in now. Oh, and of course, there are wonderful, uh, huge leaps of development, but also this inner quiet. And I think that's that space within yourself where you really do the work um, on yourself as, as a human being, um, as an artist, if you're a musician. Um, yeah, I think that space has, over the years, you know, has become very, very small. And uh, fortunately, some people maybe don't even realize the importance of that space. Um, and I think, like you said, there are so many voices now, whether you're young or old, everywhere, there's media, there's social media, there are the people who are around you, there's the news, you know, there's so many different ways to easily be distracted. And it's not even of your own intention, you know? So I think there are these uh, factors of modern day living that I think contribute to, um, yeah, maybe just this lack of, of time and space for yourself. Um, I think also as, as a musician, I often, I kind of missed that, that, <laughs> that peace and quiet. And I'm kind of an old soul to begin with. <laughs> the last question I wanted to ask you is, um, where do you think vulnerability fits into your role as a female conductor um, and also um, a Latin American conductor. And I ask this because this is something that I have struggled with, um, especially in my, uh, in my younger days, um, being a young female Asian violinist. Um, mm -hmm. I think I tended to hide my vulnerable side because being a minority, I always wanted to portray the best sides, the strongest sides of myself, whether that's, you know, being happy, uh, being strong, uh, persevering, um, being ambitious, uh, dedicated, you know, all of these more powerful qualities of myself. During this past year, um, being away from the stage and from professional commitments, I think I've really gotten back in touch with my vulnerable side. And I've come to realize that this is actually a superpower for me um, in terms of connecting with music and also connecting with people on a whole different level. And I think I, I just needed to take that step back to realize you know, how much strength being vulnerable can be and can give me and I think now more than ever before, I personally am more comfortable now with sharing a more vulnerable aspect of myself with people. Um, I'm curious, what's your um, experience with that? It's, um, I'm so glad that you asked me this question because in a lot of ways, um, I always think, uh, well, for the longest time and longest I'm saying two or three years <laughs> the longest time which is when I started my career I saw that vulnerability was what was bringing me to places that I never thought I could ever reach and it was always on the forefront of or it has been on the forefront of my professional career how I rehearse like I do believe that I listen better when I'm vulnerable that these, uh, there are no walls to what I am really. Um, I, it's the only, it was the only place um, in the podium, it was the only place that I could do it. Uh, as you said, the superpower, my superpower was like, and it was um, in, like an instinct uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I could not do anything that 
I, 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 in the podium, it's weird. I can't pretend who, are, like, I, I can be, um, because some people is like, oh, you, you need to be vulnerable, and it's not about that. You just like, you have always been born vulnerable. You just, um, you have absorbed all these things. But um, yes, at the beginning of my career, um, I people always told me what I needed to be. You know, like hey, you need to be more masculine. You need to be more feminine. Uh, you need to be more learn your English better. You need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, and it was the problem with that, which it's so sad for a uh, female artists that listen too much into this, which we all do. And um, it's just um, that we can never be who we are. So for the longest time, like I, I felt the same. And um, now I, like even now with age, <laughs> Uh, I have felt that it really doesn't matter who like who really some people will not accept you even if you are vulnerable so or uh, if you are there is no perfection you know and if there is no perfection what's the point of pursuing it because I mean in order for you to be perfect or for everyone to like you you have to let go so much of who you can be and your potential you know, like there's always gonna be like a wall or a mask that you just turn here, 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 and you just lose so much time. I, I wish every woman uh, that, ha that has a um, career and feels like she cannot be herself or that there is other aspects that she wants to explore, she should do it. Uh, and I think the I hope that as women, as an art and as artists, uh, in the future when we mentor people, uh, we can bring this to the table so other people don't have to feel it like we had to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> yes. Thank you for spending uh, your morning with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's so nice to to meet you here. And uh, I hope we can meet in person and uh, maybe, uh, you know, make music one day together. That would be amazing. Thank you for, in, for inviting me to make me part of your uh, series and just to, to talk to me and make friends with me. You always count on me for whatever you need. Thank you.